Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Loudcast. This week's guest is an author and former IRA prisoner who played a vital role in the 1981 hunger strikes at Long Cash. Richard O'Raw was a public relations officer during this period. In 2005, he wrote his first book called Blanket Men, which was the untold story of the Eights Block hunger strikes and has gone on to write several more books with his most recent book, Steak Knife's Dirty War, The Inside Story of Freddie Scavatici. No doubt we'll cover all this and a lot more, but first please let me welcome Richard. Thank you so much, Paul. It's a pleasure to be to Th- be speaking to you. Thank you so much for giving me your time today. You're welcome. Um, I really appreciate it. You know, um, um, such an interesting life you've led. So it's hopefully <laughs> we'll get a, a bit of a, a bit of a down here. Some may think too interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a chance of that, but sure, hopefully we'll we'll cover cover as much as we can about Northern Ireland. Okay, sure. Um, what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you, is sort of just go back to the start for yourself. Yeah. You know, growing up in a Republican family in West Belfast. And getting involved in the area was it inevitable you would end up in the area? Do you think, or I think there, like? I think there may have been a degree of inevitability about it. My father was a uh, was involved with uh, the Republican movement in the nineteen forties and the nineteen fifties, as was his, most of his brothers. He had six brothers, and they were all involved at one stage or another. One brother got ten years and twelve strokes of the cat of nine tails for shooting a, a police officer. Right. Uh, in the, during the nineteen forties, so it was always this. There was always a degree of republicanism in our house, and Republicans used to come into our house. Our house was a sort of a central hub, because it was uh, it was close to the Falls Road. So we, I mean, Billy McKee and Pronchias McCart and Leo Martin and guys like this, these were founding members of the provisional IRA. Yeah. These guys were in our house fairly regular. And the key actually stood for me at my confirmation. Yeah. So I was sort of way inoculated with this Republican sort of uh, ethos. You know, it was part of my upbringing. I mean, I, I knew your, virtually every Republican song there was. Yeah. Used to buy, used, you used to be able to buy wee books, song books, and yeah. full of Republican songs. And I used to learn them all. So, I, you know, I, I grew up in that ethos. And... Um, Never saw nothing wrong with it. Yeah, that was just it was life. It was just life. Just life. And then, what age then did you begin to think about getting involved in the, in the, in the struggle, if you like? Well, well, the struggle was a long way off. I mean, when I was about 15, by the time I was, fif- I was 15 in around 1969, and the civil rights campaign was reaching a sort of a, a crescendo in that... The authorities, the the unionist authorities, were beating the civil raiders off the streets, and I was quite coming. I was starting to come of age a wee bit politically, and I thought the civil raiders were right. I, th- I didn't see no reason why everyone shouldn't have a vote, yeah, and, and and why there shouldn't be equality of opportunity in terms of jobs and housing and all the other stuff. So I thought it was right. I was actually going to. I actually wanted to go on the Burntullet March. And my mother was going to let me go. My father says, no, there's going to be trouble at that. That's the only reason I didn't go on it, but I wanted to go on it. Yeah. And I was only 15. So, I mean, I, I sort of way had this uh, political inclination, even as far back as then. But growing up, even at 15, you knew things weren't right? Things weren't right. Of course they, yeah. they weren't right. We were living, we were living in a two-up, two-down house, outside toilet, I mean, our walls wouldn't take wallpaper because they were soaking. Yeah. Put up, put up a sheet of wallpaper, and the next day it was done again. <laughs> you know, that's the yeah. way we lived, and we just it was almost normal. But once, once you once you come of a certain age, you realise it's not normal and it's not right. I suppose at fifteen and sixteen is a time, and most people's lives are kind of finding their feet a bit. They're getting, you know, a yeah. sense of how life's going, and you're at a sort of like a, a perfect time, I suppose. At nineteen sixty nine, so you know. The civil rights, as you say, and then you're going into the early the early years of the troubles. Well, nineteen sixty nine was a watershed year of that. There's no doubt. Um, nineteen sixty nine, the guns came out. That's that's the difference between nineteen sixty nine, nineteen sixty eight, nineteen sixty seven. Yeah. And uh, whenever the civil rights campaign was only being launched and starting to get going, in nineteen sixty nine, the guns came out. On the fifteenth of August, nineteen sixty nine, there was widespread shooting on the Falls Road and most of it was coming from police snipers on top of the of high buildings along the Falls Road factories, Andrews Flour Mill etc and from B Specials who were covering 
the loyalist arsonists who were firebombing Catholic homes yeah. and whole Catholic streets were burned down um, less than 150 yards from where we lived yeah. Dover Street, Percy Street etc and then and that was whole Catholic streets people, kids, mothers grabbed their kids and running for their lives all their, all their possessions up, going up in smoke their whole lives going up in smoke and the same happened the next day up in Clannard and, and up in Ardoyne. So it was a pivotal moment. And I would say a lot of people's lives, it, certainly those who were in, who had to endure, yeah. the, the, who had to live through the, the bombings, and, uh, not the bombings, the shootings and the burnings. Yeah. I suppose we're... Uh, I don't want to ex- explain it this way, but the place was just waiting to explode, wasn't it? The place you know? exploded, but but it was it was it was it was, ex- ex- it was a po- but now pogrom's a bit too strong. I never really accepted it was a pogrom, but it was certainly there was a degree of ethnic cleansing in it. Yeah, because um, it was one community attack. I mean, they, people people in the north and even in the south of Ireland tend to think that. You can't criticise one community without criticising the other, but you can. Yeah. There's very few Protestant houses burned. Yeah. They were all Catholics. Yeah. This was a this was a mass assault on the Catholics of Belfast. And people like myself, I mean I was fifteen as I say, and the maid was very young, but people like myself and people older, um, were outraged, naturally. Yeah. And they were looking for a means whereby they could defend their homes and their families uh, against armed incursions and against uh, a very heavily armed state force and the B specials and the RUC proper. Yeah. And um, and that, hence, when the provisional IRA came along and promised to protect the nationalist people, people flocked to them. Yeah. So what age were you, so 15, 16, 17, were you thinking then you want to join? Oh, uh, well, not... At that stage, we're still a bit young yet. It was a bit young yet. At 16, I was trying to get in. Yeah. And uh, I actually approached Billy McKee at the funeral of Jim Saunders and Barney Watt. Um, approached him at Milltown and I said to him, I call, we called him Uncle Billy, Uncle Billy, I, I want to join the IRA. And he says, right, and he talked to me a bit about how's your dad and all this stuff. And he directed me to Jerry Adams, who took my name, and that's the last I heard of it. Yeah. So I ended up, I missed the whole, six to, I joined the IRA just after my 17th birthday, mm-hmm. in Easter 1970. Easter 1970. 71, sorry. So Easter 1971 then was the start of it for yeah, you then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and what was it like? Did you feel, what's the feeling like when you joined it? Was it, was it you feel proud? Do you feel well, good or is well, it just a natural did, thing? I did feel proud. I yeah. mean, I, I, thought, I, I thought that... Um, by that stage, I was convinced that um, the only solution to to the problems that of Ireland was the removal of the British presence. Right. I, yeah. I mean, I'd always sort of way been, as I say, been brought up in that ethos. But by that stage, I was convinced that the only the, there was there was no political way forward. I didn't see it. Yeah. Nationalists were the state was designed so that nationalists would never be in power, would always be in a minority because it was a gerrymandered state. Yeah. I, and going even if you were to fight elections at that stage, in my view, it was fruitless because unionists would always have the reins of power in their hands. Yeah. And nationalists would always be downtrodden. That's the way I saw it. And it was actually, I mean, I've, I still, if I, were, if I were looking back at that period, I would still say that was very much the case. Was it, there was a cer- certain facts that can't be altered. Totally. It was a totally gerrymandered state. I think if you look at Derry, you know that the, the, the gerrymandered, Derry, yep. 100,000 Catholics in the bog side only got one vote, or one, sorry, one seat, and there was, was it 70,000 Protestants in the water side? And the, the they, two, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's correct. Yeah. And so, nationalists had nowhere to go. People say uh, the the cutter went the cutter went with the uh, SDLP at that stage, etc. Yes, they could have, but where was the point? Where was it going to end up? Even if you SDLP reached their potential and had, say, a third of the seats in Stormont, it made no difference. Yeah. Because 
the unionists had the, the majority and were guaranteed the majority and were guaranteed the reins of power. So the likes of me, I didn't see anything other than armed struggle as a way forward. As a, let's fight the blitz. As to me, this was Mark. This was part two of the War of Independence. Yeah, and you're ready to. And I was. I mean, I was. It was. I just felt it was my duty to be involved. A few years later, um, when I was reading reading your blanket men book, which is fantastic, and we'll, we'll talk about it later, but um, it was a bank robbery. Kind of went wrong. Is how you ended up with long cash. Yeah, it's a crazy thing. Um, absolutely insane. I was I was part of an ASU, and we were told to rob this bank, and. Uh, I hadn't a clue where it was, and I never done a dummy run on it. I knew nothing about it. Told her to rob a bank, as far as I was concerned. Robbing a bank wasn't the worst thing you could have been told to do. No. <laughs> you know, you know, you know <laughs> the what I mean? Grand scheme of things. In the, in the ground, exactly. So I says, fuck it, let's go. Some of the boys who were with me didn't want to do it. They actually says, this is insane, Rick. And I says, look, we're ordered to do it. We'll have to do it. And, and that's the end of it. So we went and we went to this place called Mollusk. And I had never been in Mollusk. I had the clue where Mollusk fucking was. Yeah. It could have been in Siberia for all I knew. Yeah. And I remember driving up the Antrim Road in a van with a white van. I remember passing banks left, right and centre. And I'm saying to myself, I, I didn't say to the rest, I went, what the hell is this place? And um, we ended up beyond Glen Gormley. Yeah. It was where Mollusk was. And it was absolutely... A, and we were, our run back was back to Ballon Murphy, <laughs> about 10 mile away, <laughs> through all the Belfast, but no chance. Why do you think Molusk was chosen? It- Molusk was chosen, I think, because somebody who planned it got their track changed there every week. All right. So. Right? And he says, this, is, this would be a bank worth robbing. He didn't fucking rob it. <laughs> right? Yeah. No. So we run in and we robbed this bank. About 11,000 quid or something. I never saw a penny of it. I was out on the floor. We walked out and there was a white car there. We got into the van, took off the white car's after us. The next thing I see is a guy hanging out the, the window of the white car with the handgun. We knew it was cops. Yeah. So there was a there was a big massive chase and we all, the van crashed into a, into a garden. We all, four of us, we split up four different ways. The guy with the gun hanging out the window jumped out of the car with the gun. By that stage, this is crazy, I swear to God, you yeah. couldn't write it, couldn't write the script. By that stage, a British jeep had come in behind the white car, seen the guy with the gun, thought he was one of us and fucking shot him. <laughs> right, the British shot him. Right? And the guy ended up paralyzed for life. So we got away. I got away. I got clean away. I got half a mile away from the van. Yeah. Nobody was coming after me. I was, I, I, but what I didn't know, later found out, is that the Brits had a 34 car sort of circle uh, around the van. They were just car after car. And I got the edge of the circle. And one car went past. It was Fort William Golf Club. It split in half. And I ran across the road. And the other car near knocked me down. So I ran into the golf club. Two cops came in. Guns out. Next thing, about 30 and came in and kicked the shit out of me, right? I ended up, ended up in, in, in a, a, getting a, obviously arrested, charged. But I shouldn't even have been charged because there was no statement against me. There was no witnesses in the bank. Yeah. There was no forensics. The only thing I, I couldn't tell them where I was, so I didn't really make a, I yeah. didn't really answer any questions because I couldn't, I didn't know where I was. There's no well, alibi. That's, that's I couldn't think of an alibi. Yeah. <laughs> right. But I shouldn't have been charged because yeah. there's no evidence, but they did charge me. That's just the nature of the 70s, is it? That's it. You know? And they got this cop to say he, he chased me <laughs> from the Von Christ to where I was arrested. I actually sat in a hut in a garden <laughs> for about a half an hour <laughs> before to saying to myself, if I don't get out of here, they're going to eventually going to get around to search in this place and they're yeah. going to get me. So And they then moved off. But they said that a cop followed me the whole way. That sets me up. Yeah. But it's just part and parcel to the game. You know, mm-hmm. it's, that's, that's what happened. What did you feel when you got scooped? Was it just for fuck's sake? 
No, I thought. Did, was there. Mother in Ireland, my thought was that since when I put it in the, a blanket, man, it was true. Mother Ireland got off my fucking back. Yeah. Well, when I was reading Blanket Men, there seemed to be that at the start of it, when you're, I think it's at the top of the White Rock Road. Yeah. And one of the guys says, just take a good look. This mm. will be the last time I said, was there a bit of an inevitability about getting scooped in this run? No, was it? no I didn't no. think so. But no. she didn't know where I was going. Yeah. He did. He did. And he, he thought. He knew was, he was. Yeah. Something said, he had a sixth sense. Yeah. His sixth sense was telling him. Something's not right. You're, we're not, he said to me, Rick, look around you here. We're not coming back here. Yeah. And I said, fuck, you shake your head. It has yeah. to be done straight forward. Do you know, um, but he was right. So what year was that then? That was, that was 70, early 77. Early 77 when you got caught. And you end up in Long, you go room through the crumb and all. And, yeah. And then end up in Long Cash. Yeah, you end up in and the cash box. Then you're on the blanket. Yeah. What was that like, going in there for the first day? <sighs> the, the blanket was... The first day of the blanket w- was pretty. Uh, predictable. Mm-hmm. You went into a cell. I I actually ended up in the cell with the guy who said to me, "Rick, take a good look at this because right. we're not going to see this for quite a while." <laughs> well, he was right. And he was right. <laughs> so me and him's in the cell, and um, Blute McDonald was in the next cell to us. And we're talking about the blanket and where it's going to go and the protest, etc. And I had no, I had no, I had this, my analysis of it was that this isn't going to go anywhere. We're going to be here for years. Yeah. And I, even then I can't see how it could possibly end successfully for us. I, I mean, my, as I said in the blanket, pro, as I said in the book, my analysis was the Brits had foreseen all this. They must have sat down and said, if we do this, what will they do? So they must have foreseen a protest. They must have foreseen probably that there was going to be a hunger strike. And they must have said to themselves, well, if they die, they die. Yeah. We need to beat them on, on, on the criminalisation policy or else ulcerization, etc. doesn't work. Yeah. So that, that was my analysis. My analysis was that this was a dead end protest. Yeah. The dead end protest we have to do but it's a means to an end. It's the start but, of a means to an end type thing. Well, it wasn't even though it was an end in itself because yeah. I didn't see, I didn't see a successful outcome. No, I couldn't see it. Didn't it just didn't manifest itself to me? Blute was forever optimistic. The row always wins. I fucking couldn't. I didn't see that coming. Yeah, so that was four years in the blanket then. Three and a half. Three and a half years in the blanket. Um, I know you're very descriptive in the book. You know the maggots and the, yeah, um, putting. Um, excreta on the walls probably yeah. the best way to put it um, those living conditions are just inhumane well they are I mean I mean, you don't wash for three and a half years you don't do your teeth you're not allowed to go to a dentist if you've got toothache you just have to bear it Jeepers. right like that's really inhumane that's the way it you was know, that's the way it was you know but it we, we, was, was a decision made by by us yeah right uh, you want to, you want to, you want, if you need a tablets. Did, did many people die as a result of being on the blanket? If you know what I mean, like maybe getting sick because of. Not at the time. Not at the time, no. No, not at the time. I mean, if somebody was really, really sick, they'd have been, they'd have been excused and told, look, go on and go on up there and get mm-hmm. whatever treatment you can get. Yeah. But um, most, most of the guys who were sick had ulcers. Yeah. And they got milk. They had to get milk every day. That's how they were treated. Yeah. But um the blanket was here's the thing about the blanket. See after a week or so you got used to it. You could the body get used to anything. Yeah. And it was very, very difficult for that week not not been able to wash, not been able to do your teeth, not been able to wash your hair. Uh-huh. Your hair was a fucking mess. And then you're growing as we weren't shaving, so we these huge Huge out of beard down below my belly button, yeah. big ginger beard, and it was horrific. And and um, and then you get the shit kicked out of you, yeah. Every That's chance, a drop of a hat, it seemed to be drop of a hat. Every chance the screws got a, got an opportunity, mm-hmm. six or seven of them would have got around you and bit you up. So that was that was a did that overhanging you like all the time? All the time, was there from reading the book and reading, I've read other books about people being on the blanket, was there a it sounds maybe, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful yeah, way, yeah, but yeah. 
quite a lot of camaraderie on it. Well, there was the camaraderie. That the kept us going, really, was it? The camaraderie and the Gaelga. Yeah. The, the Gaelga give you a purpose, give you something to do. Learning Irish yeah. give you something to do where you could sit with your mate, your cellmate, and you just could, you just could ask each other, what does, what's the Irish for door, for example, yeah. what's the Irish for window? Yeah. That sort of thing kept you going. Yeah. The generative cases and all the difficulties with Irish. But the camaraderie more than anything was the, the one thing that nobody could break. Camaraderie was tremendous. The yeah. guys, the guy, the spirit of the guys that were on it, right? There was always 300. Yeah. Right? There was always 300 that never broke. Yeah. That they called us the screws, used to call us the 300 Spartans. Yeah. There was always 300 that um, never broke. And and you know and the spirit amongst those 300 was tremendous it's the 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 joking and the slagging and, and all of that there was tremendous as well you needed a you know you needed a broad shoulder yeah to stick it like thick skin and a broad shoulder exactly right? absolutely but that's what gets you through it but that's what, that's what gets, that's what gets you through it and then we, we mean we had our own entertainment every, every wing had their own entertainment committee mm -hmm. and there had been something on every night whether it was a quiz or somebody telling a story of a book they'd read yeah. or a lecture whatever and i was fortunate because i was in the, most of the time that i was on the blanket i was in the same wing as bobby yeah bobby was a very very entertaining guy great storyteller yeah. right and um and you know I was in the leadership wing for most of it, and it was. I mean, I was. I, I was in with a great bunch of guys. Yeah. As simple as that. You know, Sid Welch, Beck, and all the guys who oppose me now. They, well, they were all fantastic blokes. Can I ask a question again? I don't want to be disrespectful in this, but yeah. um, do you look back at any of that with any fondness? Oh, well, absolutely. You know I, mean? I don't I know the absolute well, awful conditions and well, awful I take, I take, being locked up. But. I look at it as, as a life experience. Uh -huh. I view life as a, 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 a series of highs and lows. Yeah. If you didn't have the lows, lows, you wouldn't appreciate the highs. Yeah. But the blanket was, to me, difficult and all as it was. And it was very, very difficult. But I had some great times on it. I yeah. had some... I met the most fantastic guys. Yeah. I was in the cell with Brenton Hughes for eight months. Yeah. The dark. But so it's an experience. Yeah. I was, Bobby was across the way from us, being 10 feet away. Pick was two, two doors down. Uh, Sid Welch was there. You know, these were great fellas. Yeah. You know, brilliant blokes. And, and I had, I mean, I met, I met some fantastic guys. Yeah. You mentioned Brenton Hughes there, the dark. Yeah. 1980 then was the first hunger strike. Yeah. And he gave the order, or he was on one of, did he give the order himself or did he, he's the first one to go on it? He was on, he led it. Aye. Uh, um, it was seven men and he led it. Yeah, and they all went on it at the same time, didn't yeah. they? Roughly, yeah. Um, and obviously that changed in the next hunger strike. Um, they then, um, towards, you know, people are about to die, they came off it thinking there was a, a deal done. Yeah. Is that, uh, no, it was wasn't. That not right, maybe? No, no, no. That hunger strike ended because several hunger strikers told the dark that they weren't prepared to die. Right, okay. Sean, uh... See, the narrative I've always thought was that they uh, thought a deal was about to be... Bollocks. But is that a lot of bollocks then? That's bollocks. There you go. So, yeah. That was a propaganda line. Yeah, okay. Right, the thing collapsed. Yeah. Right? Sean McKenna elicited from the dark about a week before it ended a commitment that the dark wouldn't let him die. Yeah. But the dark had already been told by several other hunger strikers that they weren't prepared to die either. That come with me, they were going to end it. Mm -hmm. So he was in a no-win position. He was in, in you know, in, in, that, in an envelope position. So when McKenna went into the coma, he kept his word and he, and he told the screws to feed him. That hunger strike collapsed. Yeah. Because it collapsed, the movement had to put up uh, a story that, that we couldn't say it collapsed mm -hmm. because that would have absolutely destroyed the the sort of enigma of the hunger strike the whole the whole thrust of the hunger strike that these men were so um, so 
imbued with their sense of righteousness okay. that they yeah. were going to go the whole way. So they came up with this yarn. Now, fortunately, there was a, a document coming over from London to be read. But before that document, it was even seen by the hunger strikers. Before, the only people had seen that document before it ended was Adams and his kitchen cabinet. Didn't reach the, it didn't reach the prison. Mm-hmm. And the hunger strike ended. And the next day, there was a big propaganda drive that the Brits were in the egg on a deal. The Brits didn't run the egg and fuck all. Yeah. That's the bottom line. So, and that narrative then is um, anyone sort of deviates from that sort of Republican narrative, as you found out 20, 30 years later, kind of, you know, that's not, you're not part of the narrative, you kind of get ostracized. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. That narrative held. Well, I, I genuinely, that was what I've read a few books about uh, different no, things, no, and that no, was that, always that, what I was kind that, of that understanding. Of, you should read 55 hours on the passive quill. Anthony McIntyre? Anthony McIntyre. That's a full minute by minute you know, uh, breakdown of, of the talks and everything else okay. for the second hunger strike. Oh, well, indeed. I've just made a big note of it there. But uh, you should read it. But no, no the hunger strike collapsed. That, that hunger strike, the dark told them to feed mm-hmm. Sean McKenna. He had no document, he had no idea what the Brits were going to do. Yeah. He held his, he kept his word to the guy, and that's exactly what happened. And then there was a whole propaganda drive. I mean, we had to go out. Yeah. We, we prisoners were told, I had a visit the next day as it happened. Yeah. We were told to go out and smiling. We knew there was nothing. In that very night, Bobby wrote out the Adams and says, "I want to go on hunger strike on the first of January." Yeah, that's hard. I mean, that's we we knew there was nothing. Bob Bob came back into the wing and and cheered it up the wing. Ni Euromar fac, which is gilly for we got nothing. Right, so we knew there was nothing. Bob wanted to go on hunger strike on the first of January. Mm-hmm. We were all told the next day go out, and t- with a big smile in your face and tell the. We you tell your families we got our fight the months fuck off yeah. it's all bluff yeah. and it all fed into this lane that the Brits were in the egg the Brits didn't run the egg in the lane were you all downheartened when that hunger strike ended with nothing of, of course very much so of but course. being told then you have to go out and smile and yeah. you know, uh, yeah. play the party line yeah of course of course uh, but the, the next day me and well Bick and Bobby Myself, Jake Jackson, a guy called Pat, Pat, Pat Mullen from Tyrone had a debate as to how we were going to go forward. This is the next day. After, it ended on the 18th of December. Yeah. 19th of December, we had this, we had this talk out the door and um, we didn't know what we were going to do. If we'd have had our own clothes, we'd have, went in, we'd have ended the protest and went into the system. And we'd have racked it. We'd have bought. We'd have blown the the the, the, the jail up. The jail was way yeah. open, right? Yeah. We'd have blown it up. Um, but we didn't have our own clothes, so we were stuck in, a, in an awful bind. And then we threw things about for about an hour and a half, and then Pat Malone says, "A riser stalk Akrish. Back on hunger strike." And Bob says, "Shine." That's it. That's it. And that was the debate over. And then, so that was December the 19th. The yeah. decision's pretty much made. We've, we've got to do it again. And, yeah. We're but going, this time, we're the inevitability of, you know, um, and it wasn't until the 1st of March. Was it? Well, Bob is up. Yeah. So the, the outside leadership didn't want it. The outside leadership did oppose. I mean, that, that's, that part of it's true. Yeah. They were opposed to the hunger strike. Um, but they, they were acutely aware that we were in an awful position, right? And that um, the alternative to going on hunger strike really was to go on, continue on a protest, and that wouldn't have lasted. That, yeah. would, that wouldn't have stood up, even for the most stats of us. At the end of the day, that would have been saying, if you get 20 years, you do the whole 20 years. Yeah. The alternative to that was where the prison, where in the prison garb was the big one. Yeah. That badge of criminality. That, you, you had to wear that. Yeah. And we couldn't we couldn't bring ourselves to doing it. So March the first then comes. Um Bobby's first on it. He's happy enough to be the first person on it. Yep. Knowing that the inevitable if you're gonna do a second hunger strike, 
I think I, I was watching something actually not long ago. I was in an interview with Maria Farrell, and she said, you know, hunger strikes are last, they're last ditch here because yeah. it's, it's death. You know, yeah. at the end of it. And so Bobby knew that straight away. Yeah, I'm going on this day. There, did he? Was there any chance you thought that the Brits might renege in those sixty six days at all? You know, a second hunger strike maybe bad publicity for them. You know, the prisoner. Oh, yeah. make you a venue, mean? Yeah. Do you think was there any? I know you can hope and pray, but did you have any? Did I, I never ever that? thought that. No. Even when even when Bobby was elected to, from Manus to Rome, I think it was after seventeen or eighteen deaths. I can't remember exactly when. But even then, when he was an MP, Thatcher came in and made it very clear it's not going to change anything. Yeah. And I always felt that Bobby hoped yeah. that he wouldn't die, of course. I mean, this wasn't a suicide thing. Bobby always hoped that he would survive it somehow, that some mechanism would be found or some, some means would be found whereby he could end it honourably. Yeah. But I never ever thought that, I mean, I never thought that was going to happen. Yeah. Never, from, as I told you, yeah. from the day and hour that I've been on this thing. Yeah. I was convinced that the Brits were going to, uh, would end up in hunger strike. I told Luke MacDonald that, I told Jim, uh, my, my cellmate that, and I said, I think it was good, I think the Brits must have put that into their calculations, and that they have they've agreed that they let people die, yeah. and I was convinced that Bob would die. 66 days later then, he what does. was it like when he... The night that was just awful. horrendous, awful, and I suppose that did that really kick in the belief that this is just going to go on? I mean, if well, they if they'd let one day, what's to stop them letting more day? Well, Big had to re- we we expected the first four to die. Yeah, and I mean our expectations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, came to fruition. Um, when Bob's death was horrendous. Yeah. There's no other way of putting it. It was horrendous. It was a, it was like losing your brother. Yeah. When I say that, I mean that in, in almost a physical sense. It was yeah. like losing your brother. It was awful. And to lose him in such a horrific way. Yeah. Um, and everybody, I mean, the Blanket men were absolutely shattered. There's no other way of putting it. We were shattered. And... Um, I think, but, but we didn't really have time to sort of way grieve him because Big Frank, yeah, Big Frank Hughes was coming to critical point too. Yeah. So you know you had this ongoing situation, and in no time at all the first four guys had died. Yeah. You know and and um, there was four comrades dead, and the Brits still weren't moving. Weren't shifting. Right? Yeah. And it put it put us in an awful position because there was a temptation to end it there and then. But if we ended it there and then, we were right back where we were on the 19th of December. Yeah. Right? Where we had no way off it. No, this is all about honour. Yeah. We had no honourable way off it. So we had no alternative but to put a fifth man, a sixth man, a seventh man, an eighth man, as each guy died, to replace him with another hunger strike. We needed to convince the Brits that we, we suspected that the Brits believed four men died. We'll let the four, they suspected, well, four men will die and then they'll, they'll pull the plug on it. We needed to convince them we're in this for the long term. Right? Mm-hmm. And... You needn't think that you're going to have a soft landing here because we're going to be on this for as long as it takes. That's what we needed to convince them about. And that's why we replaced Joe, uh, Bobby with Joe, Joe McDonald, right? Yeah. And so on. But I mean, I mean Beck and I, were, when we were talking about this, our, our whole thinking was we'll take Joe to the brink, but we'll not go over it. We'll play brinkmanship with Joe, mm-hmm. right? And try and see if the Brits are going to move. Yeah. That was that was the whole strategy. But if they don't move, we'll pull the plug and, and, and I'll, I'll, we can say then that we give it our everything. Yeah, and it came to that point then, 
where Joe's coming to the end of his time. The mountain climber's been in, in touch. There's the back channels working. Um, you genuinely believed and there was going to be a, a deal or some sort of deal there? Well, there was a deal. Yeah. Well, not a deal. Well, I can't say it. You know, you need yeah. to be careful with yeah. your, 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 uh, your vocabulary here because yeah. they jump all over the word deal. There was an offer. An offer, okay. That came in after the 4th of July statement. We put a 4th of July statement out, right? And in that 4th of July statement, we removed the special category end of this by saying that we don't care if all prisoners get what we get. So in that one sentence, we said, there's no special category here. We can live with prison reforms without having uh, the term special category attached to us. And that gave the Brits away. That's exactly what they needed to hear. That meant they could turn around and say there's no political status. All prisoners in Northern Ireland are treated equally. Yes, they want the change in the regime. Yes, we're going to give them an Armagh prison type regime. Yeah. And that's what they tried to do. An Armagh prison regime, the first offer was we'll have our own clothes. Clothes was the big one. Yeah. Clothes was the one that couldn't be fudged. Either we had our own clothes or we didn't. Yeah. Or we wore prison clothes. That's the long and the short of it. And they says, yeah, we're going to give you your own clothes. We're going to give everybody their own clothes. Good enough. Right. This was the offer. The other, the other stuff uh, will give you some remission back. All, these, all this was all negotiable down the line. Um, we'll, we'll um, prison work will we'll, we'll, we'll be defined as educational. If you want to do eight levels, we'll during the day, for example, classes, we'll, uh, we'll agree that that's prison work, mm-hmm. which is a big one. Yeah. Uh, letters and parcels, you'll get them anyway. They shouldn't have been in the demands. Yeah. So there was a sort of a package. But the big one was? Big one was closed. Big one was, was and we had that. Yeah. And Beck and I decided that there's enough there. And Beck wrote the outside and said to them, we believe there's enough. After Morrison came in and told Beck what was in the offer, Right, I came back, sent it up to me, and I said, "Do I think there's enough there?" I was just sort of way the elephant in the room, because I wasn't. I mean, I, I was an independent thinker. I mean, if I was ever anything, yeah. I always thought for myself. Yeah. This has been demonstrated, right? And I said to Pick, "I think there's enough there." I mean, why should we continue? And we did guys in hunger strike. If we got put, see if Joe died, we were into a second hunger strike. Yeah. And I was acutely aware of it, and so was Bick. Right? Yeah. And we both, we Bick sent out a letter saying, we think there's enough in this offer to honour we end the hunger strike, and there was. And a letter came in from Adam saying, well, we don't think so. We don't think that what's an offer uh, validates the deaths of, four, of the first four hunger strikers. And, and that was it. That's the real problem now, and then that was it. No, that's when we lost control of the hunger strike. Yeah. From then on, the They're kitchen politics. cabinet, the kitchen cabinet was in control. They were talking to the Brits. They weren't telling us. We never seen the comms between yeah. them and, and the Brits. We didn't know what they were saying to the Brits. We didn't know what the Brits were saying to them. We were out of the loop. South and back by that. There was a pretense, there was a sort of a game on that Beck was in control. Beck was in control of nothing. Mm. It was Big Jar and the boys. Yeah. And, and, they, and, they, and they told the Brits, they act, eventually told the Brits, I think, Paul Rigmer ruled around the Irish Commission for Justice and Peace, whom they wanted to remove from the equation. They had been negotiating with the Northern Ireland office. Paul Rigmer ruled around them, but I think, on, I think it was on the... Uh, 7th of July, they sent the British a communication saying that what was an offer um, did not validate the deaths of the first four hunger strikers and more was needed. That's the term they used to us, then I put in the book. And then when the official papers came out, maybe about 10 years after the book, that was the exact terminology that they used to the Brits, yeah. more was needed. And that was it. And then when Joe died then? 
you've gone in, you know, as you say, you've gone into that second hunger strike now. Well, you're, and, you're over the threshold, yeah. aren't you? And then, in hindsight then, do you think, I mean, another um, 10 people ended up dying on that hunger strike? Another, and, no, after Joe, another five. Oh, sorry, another five, but yeah, in, yeah. In, in that 1981 hunger strike. Um, and at the time, whenever Bobby went on, Bobby Sands went on hunger strike at the start, yeah. he was there to fight for the prisoners' demands. Yeah. Um, do you think, in hindsight, it's worked out that Bobby Sands and the other nine volunteers died to legitimise Republican politics in? Yeah, in a, in I, a, I do think that's yeah. the case. I think the whole... Ultimately, you know. Well, here's the point. The peace process, the, germ, the, 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 the seed of the peace process was the hunger strike. There was already a body of opinion in the Republican movement. Those who... Those who uh, coalesced around Adams were of the opinion that the armed struggle had run its course and that it, it couldn't be, uh, it, it needed to be terminated, but they needed a political course. They needed a political path to, to, to bring that about. And the crux of that was that the, the bail action for Bobby's seat and for Manus Sector own. Owen Caron was standing for it. And Owen Caron had been Bobby's election agent, mm -hmm. so he was a proxy hates black candidate because prisoners weren't, they put a rule in, prisoners aren't allowed to stand. So it was very, it was crucially important for the, for the Adams faction in order to launch the political initiative that they wanted to get Caron elected. But Caron wouldn't have been elected if there hadn't been a hunger strike. Yeah. In fact, if there hadn't been a hunger strike, the SDLP would have stood. Right, and we would have divided the nationalist vote, and so Karen wouldn't have been elected. Yeah. So, as I say, for Karen to be elected, he needed to be on a post, and for him to be on a post, there had to be a hunger strike. And they dithered and they dallied, and but that's that, in my view, was what it was all about. Yeah. And they let six guys die to bring that about. If I fast forward to two thousand five, when you brought yeah. out the blanket man book. That was your narrative on that. When it, that was what you said in the book yeah. about letting those six die that they shouldn't have. Yeah. And that has deviated from the, the narrative, I feel like. You know, the Republican narrative. The Republican um, narrative was flawed. Yeah. It doesn't stand up to scrutiny. If you read 55 minutes, yeah. sorry, 55 hours, and that's a minute by minute breakdown of what was said and who said what and everything else, yeah. it, it is, it's, it's a powerful powerful testimony of what really happened yeah. and it demonstrates beyond in my view beyond all doubt that the Adams faction kitchen cabinet um, fucked the whole thing up for want of a better word yeah. and whether they did that deliberately or not I don't know but they did did you feel ostracised then straight away when this book came out absolutely totally and was it former comrades not speaking to you type thing still don't speak yeah, to me still don't speak to you there's guys in the same cell as me still don't speak to me and how did right? you handle that then well if people don't speak to you I, I'm, I'm a I mean for example I don't shop on West Belfast I go way and let's say we're a shop but yeah. put it like this it's way it's, it's on the outskirts of Belfast yeah I don't shop in West Belfast because I don't really want to run in. I don't want the, 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 the discomfort of running into these guys and they're looking away and they're making it their business. They're letting you know that they're not talking to you, etc. Yeah. Not that I'm particularly hiding because I still live in West Belfast. Yeah. I never moved. I mean, I would still be about. Yeah. But I don't go into Republican clubs. I don't really drink anyway. I mean, I would have the odd beer, the odd yeah. glass of wine, yeah. but it would be rare. Yeah. It would be maybe once every two weeks. And I, uh, I don't look. I would never say hello first. Mm -hmm. if, if I see somebody on the street who I've known all my life, and if I knew them and I knew they were they, they, they friendly enough and yeah. they've been friendly enough and said so and have your arm with them. Yeah. But if it was somebody that I wasn't sure about, I'd wait that he said hello first. Yeah. You, is there any regrets in any of Oh, absolutely the, none. Absolutely none. Uh, in my life, mm -hmm. 
I mean, next to having my Mary and Bernadette and having my kids, I'd say the, the greatest achievement of my life was blanket man. Because yeah. I put right a most hideous wrong. And I don't really care who likes it or who doesn't fucking like it. I was right to do that. And doing that's the hardest thing, isn't it? T- towing the line's probably the easy thing. Well, it's just that easy to yeah. tow the line because it's you know, nobody's going to come at you. Yeah. But it's starting up. It's like Bobby says, I'm right. With money, the realm of time. Yeah. And I have that imbued in me. And nobody will ever, ever take that away from me. I'm right, and I was right, and I done right. Yeah. It's 40 years on since those hunger strike days. Yeah. Um, the world's changed, Northern Ireland's changed quite a bit. The yeah. North's changed quite nobody, a bit. Nobody from few. Um, Most of the guys who were on the blanket are dead. Yeah. I think it's an important story to keep telling them. Well, Most so do I. People, so people do I. Forget it. Um, after leaving, um, or since 2005, um, you've written several books. With six. Six. You've got a couple of novels in there too. A couple of novels. Um, I, haven't, I haven't read the novels yet, but I will we'll read them. The um, Northern Heights is great. Yeah. No, I'm going to say so myself. <laughs> um, I will have to get onto them actually. Um, what about your new book then? About Scapa Teaching the Dirty War. That's, I was down at your, as I said you yeah. um, earlier, I was down at the No Alibis for the book yeah, launch. It was yeah. great. There was way more people there than, you know, it was absolutely bummed out. Yeah. People standing on the street couldn't get in. Um, it's such an important book. The timing of it, you know, there's so much goes into this cauldron of this story. Yeah. And I thought the book was absolutely fantastic. Um, and if, maybe if it's okay, um, yeah. I want, want to get on a bit of the chat. I would, yeah. There's a bit of it. I'd love, just a line of it really stood out for me. Okay. Um, but if you can, where did this Freddy Scott with book come from? You know, where, Actually uh, came from where you are and where I am now, in this very room. Yeah. I was uh, just finished Gurian's Gold, which was my second novel. Yeah. Which is a Ruxian Zohar because of the protagonist in the two novels, a guy called Ruxian Zohar. Okay. I'm sure he's based and, on someone, isn't he? <laughs> well. And, um, and Connor Graham, the, my publisher in Ireland, I, I get him published, I have a publisher in Ireland and America. Yeah. Different publishers. And um, Connor Graham said to me, well, what's, ne- what's next, Rick? Well, I have another novel done, ready to go. Mm-hmm. Me and my daughter, Bernadette. And I says, well, I'm going to finish this novel. And he said to me, I have a proposition to put to you. I, well, what would that be? He says, what about a book on Scap? And I says, holy fuck. Uh, that's a truly, that's what I said. Yeah. And I was very, very, uh, did I want to do a Scap, a teaching book, right? Did I want to do another Irish controversial book again? And I was a fear about it. And he says, like, um, Canova's coming work. Yeah. Um, it's, this is going to be a huge, huge affair. So we sat and talked about it, and I said, "Okay, okay, okay, let's do it." So it was a commission. Can I ask when? When was this first? This, up this was this. I think this was about December, twenty twenty. Okay. I mean, most of this was written during. Most of this here was written during the um, COVID. Okay. So um, December twenty twenty. And I says, right, oh, and say 2020, a lot of the research was done by then. I mean, and then COVID, there was movement, there was times when we weren't locked up. And during those times, I contacted people mm-hmm. in Tyrone, in County Monaghan, in Derry, in Belfast, Republicans, guys who remind you and who I knew to be very, very senior Republicans. Mm-hmm. And they said, look, I'm doing a book on Scapatici. Um, and I want, I want to talk to you about it. And they were all okay. Everyone seemed to happen off no, the top. Not everyone. No, was, I was about to was say, was there people that just didn't want to? They didn't want to know. Yeah. No, not that they didn't want to, just didn't want to be interviewed live. Mm-hmm. They didn't want to be interviewed live. But there was other guys were dead on. And um, I ended up, I think I interviewed about 20 Republicans and all. Uh, and some were guarded and some weren't so guarded and some, you know, they've all got different different outlooks and, yeah. and, and different views. Yeah. So, but it was good to get them. I thought the book was fantastic. Before they died. Yeah. yeah. I mean, most of these guys are in their 70s. 
Mm-hmm. And it was good to get something from them that that had a, that had that had the taste of authenticity about it. Yeah. Before they died. And I was glad I'd done that. Yeah. Getting it written down, getting it getting, getting it, it written down. Getting it um from the horse's mouth. Yeah, that's it. Um, I thought the book was fantastic and really opened up again. Um the narrative I mean, there's, there's quite a bit of it. People are making accusations against Martin McGuinness. Yeah. Um and that come, comes through in the book. So it's not all just focused on, on Scap, but then um when you look at Kevin Fulton and Eamon Collins' book, you know, they all seem to be, you know, there's quite a lot of agents doing the, um, in this doing little a, squad. Doing the writing. Doing, yeah. Well, oh, oh, everything up until my, up until my <laughs> blank of our, our steak knife book, had all been written basically by British agents. Yeah. Or British operatives. So again, it's from that one narrative. So, so it's from the one narrative, and yeah. I was, I said, well, we need to, we need to see what Republicans think here. And so that's that's where my what, what, what my approach was, and and um, and it's, to come back to your point, it's difficult. Yes, there's allegations been made about guys in the Nutton Squad. Yeah. But that's all, until I have proof. Yeah. That the, these allegations are more than allegations. They'll stay allegations, and I'm not going to point the finger and say he was a tight, he was a tight, he was a tight. Yeah. On hearsay. No. Right. That's why I didn't say McGinnis was a tight. Yeah. Then there's, there's quite a. Other people are legend. Other yeah. well, other people really aren't, but what the other people are doing is other people are saying this guy behaved very strangely. Mm-hmm. Right. This guy's behaviour was far below where it should be. I mean, his whole approach to Frank O'Haggerty yeah. was anti-Republican. He was going to put Frank O'Haggerty in as the quartermaster Northern Command, which would have crippled the IRA. Yeah. And you have to ask yourself the question, why was he doing that? Why was he giving the British Army control over all IRA, IRA weaponry in the Northern Command area? Yeah. Because that's what you're talking about. Yeah, that's, that, that, that goes back to the line I would like to read from the book, because um, with all the, all, everything who had to go through the Northern Command, all operations in, all mid, in the mid-80s, yeah. had to go through the, um, yeah. the Northern Command, which would have been Martin. Yeah. Would it be okay if I read from your book? Yeah, just of course, this, of course. Um, just this one, when I read the book, um, this one line really stood out to me. And it really was, I say shocking, is maybe the, maybe the best way to put it, but it really, really stood out to me. And it's on page 118. Okay. Um, by requiring all Belfast operations to be vetted by internal security, the OC was unwittingly providing British intelligence with knowledge of all IRA plans in Belfast. Therefore, from about 1986 until Scapatici fell out with the IRA in 1991, and this is it, British intelligence was, to all intents and purposes, Deciding which IRA operations were allowed to run in Belfast and which to block. Yeah. I think that's it's shocking, isn't it? In terms <laughs> it of, you know, but I mean, that's that was yeah. that that's that's been illustrated um, in his book in in the book um, by uh, oh I forget his name Feeney Brian Feeney and it was in the, him and an IRA man wrote a book and the IRA man I forget his name committed suicide. And 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 an ASU OC. Uh, they made this allegation. That's where where it came from. It's yeah. actually in your book. Yeah. Uh, being it, but that that was that that's the reality. Scapatici was saying what ops should go through and what ops shouldn't go through. In other words, the British Army was saying Plain what IRA way. operations yeah. should should go and what operations shouldn't go. Yeah. And some operations were successful. So you have to say to yourself, it's only that can only happen because of two things. Number one, Scapatici wasn't told about the app, mm-hmm. or number two, he was told the app, and as and his handler says, let let this one go through because we can't stop them all. Otherwise, they'll realise that we've got that we have them totally uh, infiltrated. Yeah, I th- I think it really it stood out for me that um maybe just putting it and like that as well. I mean, it's something the dirty war, something that we've all sort of maybe. Known about, but with the 
Brits pretty much playing God well, and deciding who lives and who dies. And that's quite a ghost. That's a narrative of Scapatici as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's alleged of doing X amount of murders. Um, even reading Kevin Fulton's book, um, Kevin Fulton then, at the end, when he gets, he, he refers to Scapatici as Michael. Yeah, that's book. right, yeah. And he says to his handlers, he's got, you know, he's getting questioned by Scap, and they're like, go back, to make yeah. sure you go back. And, you know, they're not on the at all. Knowing that he was probably going to get executed, and that would be they wouldn't they could wipe wipe their hands of him. Yeah, you yeah. know, and I think that all it all just adds up to being just a murky, murky. Well, it was you know, filthy. The Brits, the filthy. Brits, the Brits were filthy. Yeah, the, the intelligence services, the task and coordinating group, mm -hmm. was deciding who lived and who died. I mean, all I dealt with really in the book was Scabatici's killings, murders, call them what you will. But the task and coordinating group were running Glen Ann. The Glen Ann gang. They mm -hmm. were running uh, that loyalist team over um, over in uh, I forget your man's name. He told about thirteen murders. The Haddock? Haddock. Mm -hmm. They were running Haddock. All those apps had to go up to them. They decided what was going to go and what wasn't going to go. They were deciding who was going to action this, who was going to action that. Ah, disgraceful. It's mind-blowing when you, if you sit down and think about it. Oh. Can we touch on about Scabatici, what he was like as a person? It seemed to be a lot of people were afraid of him. You know, uh, anyway, he was terrified of him. Yeah. If when he came knocking on your door... When Scab went, you when Scab went into some of them wee towns up the country, he was like the Grim Reaper. Yeah. Only he had an electric fucking safe. Right, yeah, you know that's that's the way he was, and that's the way he was. Scap was absolutely feared in the area. Yeah. Scap didn't. Most of the people who were killed by Scap or murdered by the Nutton Squad were IRA volunteers. Yeah, right. IRA volunteers were the people who had information that was important. It wasn't the ten pound tout who lived in a house was keeping their eye out, looking out the window and seeing yeah. who was running about. It was IRA volunteers that had the most precious information. And so those, those were the guys that Scap and John Joe and Nutton Squad hunted out and killed. Yeah. So when he came into the area, people says, oh fuck, who's he in for? Then there was a lot of innocent people. They killed a lot of innocent people. So you were, there was nobody was guaranteed that they weren't coming for them. Yeah. We were, the people I spoke to terrified of scap this is IRA people who were writing jobs killing people <laughs> right who were with people following their comrades who were also killed they were terrified of scap yeah it says a lot doesn't it, it does um i think it was the sandy lynch affair that kind of maybe brought scap to the head yeah um and just talk a bit about that because sandy lynch was about to be possibly executed um, well, so Sunday night just and told two, by the Brits. two days before him by Spicer Prince, mm -hmm. he was a Spicer Prince type, yeah. that he was, the area was going to pick him up. Mm -hmm. But he'd be all right because they had his back and they were going to make sure that they would, they would intervene and save him. So that's being the fool he is. How many people do you think they promised that to over the years? Oh God, and now you're talking. <laughs> now you're yeah. talking. You, Sorry, you, I didn't mean that. Just I know, a, I know, but I mean, who knows? Yeah. But uh, um, Lynch was told this anyway, and he agreed to be picked up. And within about an hour, he had told the IRA that he was an informer, mm -hmm. and he was speaking into a uh, and in, into um, well, maybe not within an hour. I can't really remember the timeline, but he was he broke anyway, yeah. and Scap had him talking into the tip. And uh, Scapatici in the meantime had told his handlers, this guy's going to get nutted. And they were, there was a row apparently between Special Branch and the, uh, the Force Research Unit yeah. through. And um, whatever happened, Scapatici. Sc Lynch was held for approximately 48 hours mm -hmm. in a house in Lanadine. But he broke very quickly, and once Scap got the got the uh, uh, got him to confess, he was out of it. Yeah. Him and whoever was with him cleared off. As far as they were concerned, they got a result. 
he was going to get another an episode. So Scab gets on to his handler, which he did all the time, and told them, look, this guy's he's in, he's in fucking 41, yeah. Lana Dune Avenue, or whatever it was, I can't remember the address. Uh, he's going to get shot. Now, I've, to, I've done my bit, I've told you. So they knew, and the three wanted to go in and rescue him earlier, and the special branch said, hold out, hold out. And then Danny Morrison walked into the house, and then that's when they hit it. And they arrested Danny and about four or five other guys. And they, they, res- they arrested them and they rescued Lynch. Yeah. So that's what happened. But, but they, also, they also recovered the buzzer. The buzzer is the device that, they, that the IRA used to see if you were carrying uh, a, a wire. A recording where just a fingerprint, and uh, yeah, and Scap's fingerprint was on the battery inside the buzzer, yeah. which was picked up inside the room where Sandy was. So here was here was physical evidence that Scap Atiche had probably been in the room. It was certainly very very damning evidence because this was the buzzer that had been used on on Sandy Lynch. Yeah. So Scap had to go on the run. He went on the run for two years. He came back. He, he met a detective uh, uh, superintendent down south called Koski. He didn't meet him. The, the Sanders did. And Koski, there's no you see man. I had battles with him. I could crack with him. So I had him court once. Uh, but anyway. And uh, he proposed that Scap say he was doing electrical work in the house where, where uh, Lynch had been held. Both of the people who owned the house were charged with Lynch. And the lady who of the house who was charged with Lynch made a statement to say that Scap had been doing electrical work. She didn't say anything about the battery, but she said he'd been doing electrical work in the house, which is very tenuous. Yeah. Shit fucking, wasn't worth the paper, but shouldn't have been worth the paper, but, written yeah. but it was enough to get him off. Right? Yeah. Not only that, but Sandy Lynch said he recognised Scap, Scap's voice. And the guy who owned the house said Scap is in the big yo yo. Yeah. Right? But he, he got off anyway. And um, he wasn't picked up by IRA. He was, no, he was the crucial element, and no, there's two crucial elements in this. He wasn't picked up by the IRA and interrogated as to how he got out of, out of, out of um, Castle Ray. Hey, isn't that that fucking stupid? Yeah. They would have said to themselves, grab him. Yeah. There's a, there's a reason why he didn't get out Danny. Out, out Danny Morrison. Yeah. Not my, he's not particularly my mate, but he's lying in the Crumlin, Crumlin Road jail. Yeah. He never saw Sandy Lynch. Yeah. He wasn't in the room. He literally put his foot in that door and they hit it. Yeah. Right? And here's fucking Scap with his thumbprint on the battery inside the room where Lynch was held and you've got the guy who owns the house saying oh Danny uh, Scab was in and out like a yo-yo said that in the statement Yeah. the police and Sonny then says I know it was Scab a teacher because I knew him and he walks out of the barracks right so he wasn't to my knowledge I don't know for sure but whatever happened he was he was free to do whatever he wanted, but I don't think he was back. He was certainly not back in the nothing squad. No, he, what he had then, yeah. and this is this is something that, uh, that, the, I only found out lately. Didn't actually find it out when I was writing the book. Writing the book, I was talking to a leading. I was talking to a criminologist, mm-hmm. who had read the book when it came out, and says, "I'll tell you exactly what happened to Scap after he came out." came back to Belfast in 1989, he had what's called a narcissistic collapse. Scap was a narcissist. Yeah. He was a very strong character. When Scap walked into your room, people came to attention. He was elevated. He was, he liked the thought of being the man in the big picture. He had a huge uh, opinion of himself. He believed he was superior to most other people. So he was a total and absolute narcissist. And then he gets thrown out of the IRA in 1981, which means that he's no longer access to important information. 
Because he no longer accessed the important information from the IRA, he demands of his handler that he sees the GOC, right? Yeah. Northern Ireland, General Officer Commandant, guy called Wilsley, maniac, but another, it's another story. He's in the book as well. He, he sees Wilsley and he wants to see Wilsley for one reason. He wants to be assured that he is still a valuable lead, that he is still their, most, their, their golden egg. And Wilsley does does the business accordingly. Wilsley meets him, says him, you're still a very important guy, Scab. Yeah. That's what three us three things he done. One of them was crucial. The second thing he done, he went to like so we Frankie Mulhern, told Frankie Mulhern, right? Yeah. Frankie Mulhern's son Joseph was shot dead by the IRA, his volunteer. And he went and he said to Frankie that he <coughs> he was there when he was shot and that he took the guy shot him in the neck. And he wasn't dead, and he told the guy, shoot him in the head, kill him humanely. He was trying to present himself as a humane killer. Yeah. The third thing he'd done, which was the one that broke him, was that the Cook Report were having, were doing a programme on Martin McGuinness, a two-week programme, and Scamp watched it. And after the second, the second episode was shown, he phoned the Cook Report up and says, look, that's a load of shit. You just need to talk to me. So he met members of the Coog Report in the Culloden Hotel in 1883. And on tape, he told them about that McGuinness was the guy who sanctioned all killings by the Nutton Squad. He gave them a whole big rundown on the England Department and the IRA and who was what and who wasn't what. And he named everybody. And more a person, one of the reporters was a girl called Sylvia Jones. And the special branch man heard that Scap was bubbling and pleaded with the Cook Report, please don't, please don't run this. He's our, he's a very important informer. If you run this, he'll be shot dead. So they held it, carried it, kept it down. And then when Scap was out it in 2003, he was going to brass snack it. Right, he was no intentions of going fucking anywhere. The air was backing him up. Adams. McGuinness, Morrison, Jerry Kelly all come out and says this is pretty secure crats trying to destroy the reputation of an honourable man. Yeah. Words to those effect, that's I'm paraphrasing here. And this went on and Scap was saying, Scap met the anti town news and said, Look, bring the families to me, I will look them in the eye and I will tell them I never killed your sons, I'm not steak knife. And this went on for the best part of a year. He was brass snacking and he was going fucking nowhere. He'd still be here the day. Yeah. Except Sylvia Cook, or Sylvia Jones, said, enough's enough. And she released that tape where Scap talked, had Scap had talked 10 years earlier in the Culloden, and that, there was no escape from that. No going back. There was no going back. And then he got the boat and he was gone. And he knew the minute he got the boat, it was over. And he got the boat and he was away. I think I remember reading um, recently enough one of the interviews and he was saying it's, I'm not that Freddie Scrabble teacher it's, it's a different well, Freddie Scrabble he Scar- denied it he's all brilliant. the brass the, neck as you say is the, the he, turn to absolutely he, <laughs> he, he, Paul he'd see if Sylvia Jones hadn't have released that tape yeah. she also wrote an article in the people about it yeah. he'd have brass necked it he'd have been still living where he lives and saying to people, I'm not fucking scrapping yeah. scrap it. I'm not steak knife. Steak knife somebody else, not me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, done it, I can't know. be too many Freddy Scrapper teachers running around. No. Mm-hmm. Um, I know we're getting on for time here, so I'll not keep you for too much longer, but just um, the Canova report is coming out pretty mm-hmm. soon, we, we believe. Um, your book um, about steak knives come out a few weeks ago. Um, Canova says come out in a few weeks. Boucher has now been made the PSNI Chief Constable. Yeah. Um. And uh, from what I understand, it's going to be the PSNI have to release the Canova report. Yeah. That's so right. there's a whole clash of all sorts of things going on there. Yeah. How do you think that's going to pan out? And have, have you got any idea how the Canova report's going to? No. Um. Going to go. Um. I I've been told by someone who read it that it's very critical of the security forces of the intelligence services. Right. Yeah. And. Boucher, to his credit, has told most of the families that what I said in the book is true, mm-hmm. that 
Scappatici always told his handler about who was going to be shot dead and the handler always passed it up the lane to the task and coordinating group and they invariably said to hell with them or her they have to be shot we cannot expose Freddie and whoever else in the leadership is involved is, is working for us right yeah. and so they let all these people die I think that's what Boucher's going to say I hope that's what he says anything less than that I think would be a fudge yeah I'd be right on top of it I'll tell you do you think there'll be any because he potentially could be you know he's in for the job now yeah I know he's interim at the minute but he could be the, the chief constable of the PSNI soon do you think there's any issues there with the release of Canovo no I think, think Canova's going to be released be okay. um, I don't know what his I'm not, I'm not sure he'll have to have some sort I would imagine of press conference mm -hmm. and he will do I would imagine some very specific interviews probably UTV BBC yeah. maybe Sky a couple of those it's I would, uh, but it's going to be difficult and, the, ta and the, the measure by which he's going to be assessed yeah. is the book yeah. the first question is going to be asked him did Scapa teach you tell his handler about every killing yeah. and even if he only says she has got teach was going to be charged with 19 stiffs mm -hmm. 19 murders right so even if he only says no he only done it 19 times doing it once is enough isn't it doing it once is more than enough yeah. right but we know he done it more than enough big Jimmy Kearney yeah. has already made it very clear that Scapatici he has the evidence uh, he is a miser where Scapatici's phoned up his handler and says we have Michael Kearney down here in Dundalk and he's going to be shot dead it's looking very black for him yeah. and they let him go they let him, they let him be killed you've lived a long life through the troubles here and through the north and all the issues it's had how do you see the future of this place Victor? how do you think it's going to end up I don't know I, I don't know I I hope it ends up in a united Ireland do you think that's I, I think that I think constitutionally politically and rationally mm -hmm. that's the that's the only way that that's the best way in terms of in terms of the welfare of the people, I'm a Euro I'm a I, I'm very much a European uh, type person. I believe in 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 the European Union, and I, I mean I look at the south. Uh, funny enough, I was down in Cork last week, and I was talking to these Cork guys, and I said to them, "You just don't even realise how how envious your position is." And I says, "What do you mean?" He says, your fucking government's putting billions away every few months. Yeah. Do you, do you not realise that? That's surplus money. Yes, they're sticking away for a rainy day. Yeah. He says, see, in the north, you can't get a hospital appointment. Yeah. The, 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 whole hosp the whole medical staffs on the, uh, are, are on the... are on the... on, the, on, the, on pickets. They're on their knees, isn't it? The he says, the north is... the north is... On England. England's really for bankruptcy. There's nobody working in England. They're all on picket lines. The the railway people, the medical staff, the doctors, yeah. everyone, right? Prof the university professors, everybody's, all, all everybody's out, and and the economy's going nowhere. The worst thing they ever done was leaving the European Union. Yeah. I said to the court guys, just yeah. don't know how good you're getting it. I think that. And yeah. I think that's. I mean, yeah. I think United Ireland is the only way forward. Yeah, it's inevitable. I think I it's see. inevitable. I th well, you, you see, the problem is it, it'll happen when that middle strand of unionism decides it's going to happen. Yeah. Right? I think that that's slowly happening too. Well, people, um, and, and the, people the professional classes, the middle classes, mm -hmm. they follow the money. Yeah. And the more, uh, Britain is bankrupt. Britain is down, down, down the very hole in terms of its economy, whereas the Republic is one of the richest countries in the world now. Yeah. Because of twelve and a half percent tax rate. Yeah, corporation tax. Corporation taxes. You, you drive down around Cork, etc. All you see is Amazon here and and Apple there and 
and people full employment. Yeah. There's only people now working down south are people who are on in in validity. Yeah. You know, so it's full employment, and it's a very, it's a very wealthy place. Well, you're right. It's that middle ground are going to be the one with the decision makers. And, it, and yeah. it, but it's a difficult, it's a difficult leap for them to constitutionally say we're going to break our Britain. Yeah. The trick, in my view, is making it as late, as as palatable as possible. Don't make it hard. Let's. I think that's one thing. Um, to get not to get quite deep towards the end here, but. Unionism never tried to sell the union, no. the nationalism at well, all. They couldn't. Ever. They couldn't no. But they never even tried to. Did they? No, they didn't. They never no. tried to make it work. They let it, you know, in the in the early days, to sort of show. And it's only whenever the kind of the party of esteem, as we called it earlier, you know, from nineteen ninety eight, the Good Friday tried to make things equal. They tried to, you know, they're trying to w- w- um, wheedle back in now to try and try to make it work. And it's too late. It's too late. You know, and I mean, events have overtaken unionism. Yeah. The world's overtaken them, and as I say, the South went from a bankrupt country in 2008 to one of the richest countries in the world today. Yeah. They're putting billions away every fucking, every three months. They're putting four and five billion away <laughs> for a rainy day. It's all right, isn't it? <laughs> um, just finishing up, Richard, as I say, thanks very much for your time. You're welcome. It's, it's been great. Well, I've really enjoyed this. Um, just about touching on what about you? What do you like to do to relax? These days, um, any, any uh, well, I, 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 would, I would go to the gym two or three times a week, okay. and uh, I write. I mean, I would like, I like, I don't view writing as a chore. I was going to say, is there more books in the often now? Oh, well, as I say, there's a novel sitting waiting to go, needs a couple of we, a couple of days' work, maybe a week, yeah, to put a lot of twists and stuff in there. And as the novels. What do you prefer, or do you think there's more? I prefer novels, uh, and is that what you're going to focus on? Do you think? Only, I, I, and I, honest to God, I hate freaking these factual books. Yeah, um, because I was going to ask you, like, actually, do you think there's more stories of the troubles to tell? Because I think the troubles does get told quite a bit. In I don't areas, think they've touched on it at all. Do you think there's so much more to come out? Oh, absolutely. And do you think there there's probably a couple more books in your Richard? Hopefully, I oh, don't know. <laughs> And someone else, maybe. <laughs> I I want to focus on novels. I, I have an American... My American publisher's pushing me hard for a third Robson O'Hara book. That's a novel. So yeah. I'm going to be... I'm going to get this one away. This one that I, me and my daughter have done has got nothing to do with Ireland at all. Uh, it's called The Witchfinder General. Okay. Right? Yeah. And uh, it's got nothing to do with Ireland. And then when I get that away... I'm going to do a Baroque to her book in the head, yeah. so I'm going to get stuck in the head. And maybe in the new year. <laughs> maybe in the new Relax year. Relax for Christmas and enjoy, and well, enjoy whatever Santa brings you. That's it. Then, Richard, can I, th- well, just, it's on um, social media. I know you're a bit more active on social media these days than the, your Instagram account. I think that's oh, I know, that's hard for that. Yeah, oh, yeah. I don't do any of that. <laughs> I, I'm not on Twitter or nothing. I don't, I don't, not that, I don't like being too accessible. Yeah. You know, I just don't like it. I like I like being in my world. Yeah. And there's a lot going on out there. So it's good to stay away from it. Sorry. There's a lot going on out there. So it's good to stay away from it. Well, I, I that's yeah. it, and I don't like I don't like people having uh, access to me. No. Well, can I put your the Instagram handle up for people yes, to follow? Yes, of course, of course. Because um, you're saying that it's your daughter burned out running. Yeah. It. That's how when I met you a few weeks ago, and I said I'd, I'd love to interview you, and you said you were kind enough to say yes. You told me to message this, to, you know, the, the sort of, she does your, do you do, does your, does your diary for you? Or she does. She looks right, after right, you. Right. So um, if you want to follow, um, follow the story, uh, it's at Richard underscore O'Raw. Um, obviously your new book, Steak Knife's Dirty Wars Out, all your other books are all available from every local yep. bookshop going and online, no doubt. Um, and I'd just really like to thank you very much for your time today, Richard. Well, it's been an absolute Paul. pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Well done, Brilliant. son. Thank you. Just- That's good, Craig.